Cool. Good morning, everybody, and happy Monday. Excuse my appearance. I'm ready to go to the beach in the motorhome for the week in Ventura and go chill out. And we're waiting for Jesse Zagorski. Hi, Theodis. Good morning. Another REO legend. So I just wanted to kind of start out, guys, by giving you a little background story. Um, with this corona thing being over and there's a lot of uh, economic wonder superstars um, saying that we might have another recession, we might have some REO coming up. And so what that means in our coaching group is we have so many people saying, Mike, I know you were in REO. I know your friends were all in REO and I want to learn about REO. For those of us that haven't been in the business quite as long as I have, um, people are always like, hey, you know, how do you get foreclosure listings? And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that today and make sure it's on the podcast so I have something to send to people when they ask. So it worked out perfectly. Um, back in the recession in 2006, when, I, when it started happening really hard, uh, it was very important for me to diversify uh, my business portfolio. And I was pretty convinced that property management was more important to me than REO. So in 2007, I started uh, SCV Leasing, which is now California Leasing. Currently, we manage 600 doors. And that particular company did take me through um, some really rough times. We had predictable monthly cash flow. Uh, it boosted my sales. It created a little more freedom to do other things. So by 2010, when that was up and running, um, I was working at Keller Williams and a friend of mine, the team leader there said, man, you recruited like 12 people to our company this month. I love you. Uh, how can I ever repay you? Jesse's trying to get on. Oh, here he comes. Um, and I said, you know, I'd really like to get into REO because I was looking around and I saw some uh, agents getting very wealthy selling foreclosures. So naturally I was jealous and I said, well, I want that. It can't be that hard. What do I do? So at the time the team leader came from las vegas and knew david golden uh, which all of you know is my sponsor at exp and a good business partner and they um ran a reo network group which at the time good morning jesse how are you buddy? we're live we're recording everybody's on the whole thing awesome so i said i'd like to be introduced to somebody that can help me out with reo so um long story short i made a phone call to david golden and uh, lo and behold, uh, Rio Mac was happening the same weekend in Palm Springs. David Golden asked me to come down and I was introduced to Jesse, who that beautiful face is you see there. Uh, I think you're on mute, Jess. And, mute. um, uh -oh, am I on mute? No, I'm good. I hear you. <laughs> okay, good. My, my level is down. So I'll jump in real quick. Um, so Jesse and Dave at the time ran DS Pros, which is a default services network group. And kind of like any other network group in any other industries designed to network and help and learn and mastermind and all that good stuff. So since 2010, Jesse and I have become very close friends. Uh, Jesse is also a business partner of mine at eXp. He's in uh, Encinitas, California. And one of the quintessential REO people, and not only because he's so smart and experienced, but Jesse is also a master networker. I mean, he, I've known Jesse since 2010, that's 10 years. We've traveled this world together. We've been everywhere together and never in my life have I heard one bad thing said about Jesse. Never in my life has Jesse ever been involved in any type of drama. And Jesse <laughs> continues to pour his knowledge in himself and his heart into our businesses. So, um, so that's why I have Jesse on today. He's uh, still running DS Pros. We all kind of run it together and um, DS Pros is very active and you can join it. It is um, somewhat geographically exclusive depending on where you're at, um, who we have in the group, how much they um, participate and travel with us and whatnot. And some of the metro areas are so large, there's room for several. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Since we're talking about it, Jesse, good morning. How are you, my friend? Good morning. That was like the best intro ever. 
<laughs> I love it. And and we didn't comment. I've never seen. Is this a new Zoom background for you? With the uh, the you have many leather bound books of rich mahogany. Yeah, this is my library. So oh, so nice. you know I'm in my closet. Picture each book a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I love but, it. Yes, how many people are in DS Pros nowadays? Uh, probably like 40. I'd have to count the exact number, but probably around 40. I mean, it's still, it's a decent amount of people given the fact that REO is pretty low these days. Right. But everyone who's in it still does, or most people in it still does do a handful of REO deals, and they're all just like me waiting for it to come back. Right. We, we all believe that our market's cyclical. Things, it's just timing. At some point, it, it will come back. Yeah, and I definitely want to talk about that. So, so for those of you that are not in Southern California, we have members of DS Pros that are um, still having, you know, 50, 100 assets in certain parts of the country. In certain parts of the country, it's just normal. So it's so nice to have these people in the network group because they're still super active. They're paying attention to what's going on in the industry. And then every Friday morning at 8 o'clock, um, Jesse runs a Zoom call with the entire group and kind of share which we've done for 10 years yeah <laughs> yeah that's pretty <laughs> consistent right yep um it's a nominal fee to be part of it it's just it just helps pay for the group to um break even basically and keep the group organized and the website up and whatnot so it's it's a pretty interesting thing um man i there's so many different things i want to talk about jesse but what, what, what group are we live in right now is this agent mechanics yeah we're in agent mechanics awesome. and we're being recorded for the real estate marketing show podcast Cool. Love it. <laughs> so, love it, love it. So, so agent mechanics in terms of coaching, I'm assuming most people watching are probably thinking, is REO coming back? How do I get REO? That's probably the most likely questions people are asking themselves if they're watching an agent mechanics, right? And that's why we're on right now because we're going to answer that question because so many people are asking if REO comes back, what do I do, Mike? You know, you're the coach. I know you've been in REO and I know you're a default specialist. So teach us. So there isn't anybody better to have on than you. So talk to me, Jesse, give us a little bit of background about your REO experience so we can lay that out and then we'll dive into getting REO accounts and the theory behind that. Yeah. yeah. So, so my experience was, um, uh, like you said, see, I mean, I, so I've been in real estate for 16 years and I did got in when there was still a good traditional market. But about, uh, and I got into it in 2004, by 2007, 2008, the writing was on the wall that, you know, four years in, I'm like, well, this market's about to, about to change. And that's when I got into REO. I actually had a coach at the time who suggested I, uh, I get, I check out REO. I said, what's that? I have no idea. They uh, helped get us our first REO account, which I paid no attention to. I had one property they asked us to sell. I'm like, this is interesting. There, there was a website and a portal where they, uh, you know, send you emails of things to do. And um, I didn't really pay much attention. And my coach said, no, you really got to get into REO. This is going to be big. So he said, go to an REO conference. And that's when I jumped in. And kind of like your story, I went to my first REO conference. I was like, this world is awesome. I like how, you know, it's all about who you know. And so it's just a matter of building relationships. And it's a system-oriented business. There's lots of... Uh, um, it's there's checklists and steps and it's not like sometimes in real estate you do a lot of items where you're like I have no idea if this is actually gonna get me paid this is like step by step by step this is what you do and you end up getting paid at the end of it because you sell the house and you know the company wants to sell the house because they, they ain't keeping it there's no there's no hey are we gonna you know they might even if they price it too high to begin with you know that price is coming down and the thing will be sold because they have no choice so I, I worked with probably over 30 different clients from servicers banks and just spent five years living out of a suitcase, making connections in the banking side of things. We really did live, live out of suitcases. Pretty oh, fun. Yeah. So one of the things that I like to point out with about REO is, you know, we might court a seller for six months to a year to get their listing. Well, we can court an asset manager or a servicer for three to six months. And we don't just get one listings. We might get 20, 30, 50 a year, sometimes more. And because of those relationships, they give you referrals too to their friends in the business. And they all, they all call each other and say, hey, I don't have anybody for Santa Clarita, California. Who do you use down there? Oh, Mike Bjorkman. And, and, and these things just start happening. And what I really liked about REO when I first saw it, like when I got in the 90s, it was very local, right? Like you just went to the bank, you walked in the door, shook the manager's hand. But then in the 2000s, it was much different. And I, when I got to that first conference, I said, look around, these people are from all over the nation. And I hate how real estate is so local sometimes. That's why I love eXp, that I can deal with people all over the country, right? So I was literally in a room with people from New York, people from Florida, people from Salt Lake, Denver, Philadelphia. I was like, this is cool, right? And it was a really real sense of, 
kind of like put on the big boy pants of real estate, right? And 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 it was super fun and just kind of it wasn't it was hard work, don't get me wrong, but it was a lot better than an open house or door knocking, you know. It it weighed on our families kind of heavy with the travel and the way we were gone, but it was just a super super unique experience that kind of revived me in real estate and quite honestly that day I met Jesse, um, and it's, it's one of our favorite stories. I didn't realize how big of a deal it was, but within 90 days, I had 12 accounts. And this happened somewhere around springtime. And by December of that year, I had over 75 listings. I, I was just going to say, so tell people what, what 12 accounts means. That means 75 listings. So like it was 12 different clients, different banks, different servicers. And, you know, the the network group, we would all pitch in and we would have lavish parties we would go to football games and baseball games and concerts and just do things because we were able to pitch in um we were able to do things that most people could never dream of doing so we would invite the clients with us to come to these events and we'd hold parties whatnot and we had a very um great opportunity to keep them very close to us in a very private intimate setting so we could actually build those relationships it wasn't like running up to somebody at a conference and saying hey i'm mike bjorkman here's my card call me if i could ever help you no we got a chance to learn about their families where they live their background and create true relationships so with those events that we were holding uh, i was able to create like i said 12 and 90 days and they were all different um, bank managers and asset managers and whatnot. Um, so eventually I got signed up on all their systems. And before you knew it, you know, we were hiring runners and we were hiring special bookkeepers and, and I was actually in REO. And at the time I thought, well, that was just cool and easy, but I didn't realize that I had a dramatic, you know, jump start into REO because of my relationship with Jesse. And then since then, we've always masterminded together and kept our relationships very tight. And the big problem with most people is once REO goes away, they lose those relationships and they don't pay attention to where they're going. Um, and that's, that's kind of the idea behind DS pros is to keep all that moving because let's look back, Jesse, how fast did 10 years go by, you know, pretty darn fast. And yeah. what's, what's again. Right. Well, what's interesting is you talk about the, uh, some of the events and things like that that happened and the rules of the game changed over time. At first it was a little like the wild west where, you people were just like you could invite anybody out to anywhere there was no no real rules and then as the bank started setting up more systematic rules of like here's what's acceptable here's what you can do here's what you can't we had to learn to play by those rules um right because it's not that's not worth jeopardizing one of these accounts that you've gotten if you're you know inviting someone somewhere they're not supposed to be and so i find that these days things are a lot more professional in terms of like you know you're building relationships in a different way if it if and when the industry opens back up to a huge volume, I think that's when it starts to get more, when they just hire in all these people and they're just like, just go sell stuff, right? Just that's where it gets to be more how it was then. These days it's a little more professional, I think, in terms of the settings in which you, you interact with these asset managers. Yeah, and strategy is extremely important too. And I think I was kind of lucky because I was a community outreach specialist, right? I was a professional right. networker and I would go out to chamber mixers and I would go out to different charity events and I learned how to professionally network without being cheesy. So it was a natural progression for me. Uh, these just people weren't just not in my town. They were from all over the country. Um, so I think that was a really big thing. And, and as those rules did change and they, you know, people got busted for, you know, highly illegal kickbacks and all kinds of weird, just weird stuff. And we were very lucky that, well, I was very lucky to have Jesse as a trainer and a mentor and a coach because he was the one guiding me through the process of, hey, don't do this, and this person doesn't like that. And you know, so as a network group, as a team, as a tribe, we were able to get things done in a fashion that most people could never dream of. And, and again, it's work in our business today with our networking, that's exactly how it's still working. Um, so how would you start by saying, let me, let me just say that Jesse, I'm an agent, I've been in the business for seven years, REO went away, how do I get into REO? What's my first step? So one, you'd have to commit to really wanting to, to, to do REO. It is not for the faint of heart. It takes some capital that you have to have saved. That really, I, I, whenever anybody asks me, how do I get into REO? I start by trying to talk them out of it. I do. Because right? it's, it's one of these things that if you think this is a, an easy thing where you're like, I'm just going to jump into REO. But I try to talk you out of it. If I can't talk you out of it, right? And because it does take some back when, you know, we can hop on planes again. 
it really will take some travel. You can do it without. You can try just emailing people, which some people had some success with, but you're really a lot better off getting belly to belly. So there's some travel, there's some time there. And the fact that you're early on in the cycle means you're not going to get a really large return on investment. There's probably better things to focus on today. You have to know that you're at the phase of your business where what you're doing today is more of a long-term build of these relationships. Assuming I didn't scare you out of it, that when you get these properties, you're dealing with uh, occupied houses that the people you know may or may not want to leave. And you know, you got to get a uh, hard, hard in your heart in a way, knowing that you really are trying to help these people do the best what's right for them. But after three, four, five years of someone not making a mortgage payment, they can't stay there forever for free. So I'd rather have someone on their side who's more of an advocate who could actually help try to help get help them you know create a next step and a plan. But um, yeah, what would you do? It's about who you know. The industry is still the same. Nothing has changed at that respect. It's depending on where you are geographically in this country. If you're in a more saturated market, like any of the big cities, it's who you know. If you're in a market, like we have a couple of friends in Kansas City that cover some pretty rural areas, right? It, not necessarily who you know, they might just find you on some websites. So there is some setting up, you know, signing up on certain websites we can talk about, making sure your profiles are there and active, that you might just randomly get, uh, you know, some, some business. But again, knowing, knowing, knowing people absolutely helps. I kind of describe it to agents. I say, it's just like geographical farming. You can't just send out a postcard and think you're going to get all these listings, right? right? The person who does good geographical farming holds events. They have um, multiple touches during the month. Uh, they door knock, they hold open houses, they do mailings, they do Facebook groups, they do all this stuff on top of it. And then they get belly to belly with their geographical farm. Yeah. It's very rare where you can just send out postcards and in the, and to equate that to REO, it'd be like just trying to find out who asset manager and saying and sending emails, like you said, hi, I'm Jesse Zagorski. I live in, you know, San Diego, California. Can you please give me listings? They're like, yeah, I got a hundred of those before lunch today. Delete, 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 delete. But <laughs> when you're at a conference and Jesse Zagorski introduces you to somebody, the fact that you're standing next to Jesse gives you a lot of clout and they will go, well, if he's a friend of Jesse, he should probably be a friend of mine or she or whatever. And you get an in and then you have that opportunity to bond. Then you follow up. Right. And would you agree? Follow up is just as important after a conference or an event than any, just like follow up with a client, right? Follow up is more important. It's, it's, I mean, it, it's funny. Everything you just said, we can talk about it in the context of REO but it works for any lead source. It works for building any relationship. When you get introduced by someone else, it's establishing credibility, right? It's just like when you, when you have a lead, it's like leveraging some of your testimonials. That's not like your, or, or if you have a referral that sends you to somebody else, you have more credibility there. Um, and yeah, it's all the follow-up, especially REO because the, the, the cycle of from when you meet someone to when they have business to assign to you can be really long. You might be following up three months, six months, 12 months before you get your first deal with them. And then from there, it does start to pick up faster. But yeah, it's all of is, is the only thing that matters in REO. It's, it's so true. And, and that's part of the strategy that I, would, that I was talking about. Like, you know, I had a very unique strategy. I would just like networking at normal events. I would ask them, you know, five questions, Ford, Family Occupation Recreation Dreams. And I follow that to this day. And then I would get to know them, find their hot points. So Cindy has a four-year-old daughter that means the world to her. Bob <laughs> loves boating and Joe loves golfing and Jennifer loves making crafts on the weekends. And then we'd send them little gifts and we would, you know, I'd follow up with them on LinkedIn and eventually their Facebook and then try to get in their life personally if they needed any help with, you know, other real estate agents or help with training or, or who knows what. Um, but that follow-up was just, incredible and 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 quite honestly um dollar for dollar was the best you know prospecting you can do and it's kind of funny like like the, like our predecessors at exp made it happen for us right they went through all the bumps in the road they went through all the introductions they went through all this stuff and then you and i get to slide in and just boom so, we're in right so that's kind of like how you and dave were with ds pros like since i came in two years late i got to slide right in and just take advantage of all the thousands of hours you put in you know and that was the reason i was willing to write a big check you know that right. first time i mean i think dave told me all right uh give me your credit card number i'm gonna run it for two grand 
Plus, you got to join DS Pros, which is fifteen hundred bucks up front. It's one hundred seventy dollars a month. And I just took my credit card and I said, "Here, I just got to jump in blind, you know, and just trust the system." Right. You know? And that worked. And it was kind of like I got to buy my way in, uh, but I had to fit in with the crew. I had to, I had right. to, you know, I had to take those lumps and, you know, and and learn everybody's personality style really quick. And uh, but it's it was just a very unique thing. What, how much market knowledge do you think? is required to get into REO? Ooh, good question. To do well in REO or to get into it? I think you could probably get into it with very little market knowledge. I think you better learn market knowledge really quickly, but it mm. depends if you're pretty good at fake it till you make it. Right. So if you, if you come across like a intelligent, well-spoken person, because REO is about who you know, and if you are able to um, you know, talk the talk with certain REO keywords if they come up. No one's ever going to ask how many REOs you sold. Like, I don't, did, did, when you first started, did anyone ask you how many you sold? Not one. Did anyone ask you even market knowledge, how much you know about your town? Not one. <laughs> like, like, truly, it's, it's there. They just assume that if you are hanging out in that world and you sound like you know what you're talking about, you must be pretty good. And I, this is both a, a double edged sword, it's a good and a bad thing. Asset managers are the people that control the business on the REO side of things. I found over the years that bef until you make friends with someone, once you make friends with them, then you're a real human being. But before you make friends with an asset manager, every real estate agent is the same to them. They are all interchangeable. We are all a commodity. We're all, and frankly, they dislike most of us, just to be transparent, right? Because most of us have, had, and I don't say us, but like we've, Agents have let them down so many times. If you figure you're selling a couple hundred homes a month and dealing with all these knucklehead agents around the country, this is not my opinion. I love agents, right? But if, you, if you're an asset manager, you start to get a little jaded sometimes. And the ones who aren't jaded, they just love everybody. So either way, they're still interchangeable. And so they're going to give you, they're just, hey, if, if we're going to try out somebody new, they're going to try you out based on the fact that they know, like, and trust you. So if you don't have much market knowledge, where you're going to get into trouble is when that property first gets assigned to you, one of the first things they have you do is a broker price opinion. You better put a lot of details down to illustrate your market knowledge and better make sure the asset manager looks really good with their market knowledge so that they can go to their investor who's the one who really owns it and you want to make them look like a rock star. Yeah. That's, that's the goal in REO. So do you need market knowledge? No, but it really helps once you actually get into, into the weeds. I want, to, I want to touch on two things you said. Um, first that. So what I didn't know when I was new in REO was that I, everybody was like, don't bug them. They're like these gods and just, just be happy you have it and don't bug them and don't call them. But I didn't know that. Right. So I'd call them and I'd say, Hey, let's talk about this property and get them on the phone. And they'd be, Oh, tell me more. Tell me more. And I wouldn't just take pictures. I would do videos and I would explain things as I saw it. And they're like, you're the best agent we've ever had. Like you're going way over and beyond. And, and when it came to marketing the property, since I didn't know better and I wanted more, I would do everything the same I would do for a retail customer as I would for the banks, meaning beautiful virtual tours. And, and most agents just treated listings like they were just, you know, numbers and terrible flip phone pictures with their Blackberry back then. And, and I'd be like, no, I'd still hire professional photographers. Even if the house was destroyed, I would still make it show as good as I could. But even for the asset manager, like, so I went over and above and they loved that. They were like, this is the greatest guy in the world. And then they would send me referrals. But going back to asset managers don't like us, I'm gonna tell you why. It's very true, they don't like us. Number one, they go great. They just nailed this $200,000 a year account because of me and I'm over here and let, let's be honest, asset managers, a really good one might make 80 grand a year. And I mean, might. And when the market crashed, a lot of the real estate agents couldn't make it in the business. So they went to work for banks or they had an in or a friend. So they went to a salaried position from being a real estate agent. So they know what it's like to be a real estate agent. And now they're just rolling their eyes because they know the difference between a good and a bad one. And, and if you guys appreciate my honesty, nine out of 10 agents suck in this world. So the, the reality is, is they were already grumpy and I'll give you the best. Not the ones watching this webinar. Right, none of these guys. No, they're not right. allowed in this group. Right. Right. The, the, and that's the thing that everyone in our world here tends to be the top, the top of the top, the best of the best, the top 1%. But this is why when we say like asset managers do like agents, I have plenty of friends who are asset managers. I don't want to scare people that like asset managers hate all of us. They just, they've been let down enough times 
that they start to, to really like, you know, have a filter that they see the world and where they're like, ah, all right, go ahead, keep going. So the, the thing for me is I learned really quick that these agents that became asset managers, they know us, so they get it, right? But I, I this was my analogy as a new construction a real estate agent. Out where I live, we have massive tracks that are built, hundreds. So a person will come and stay at a track for a year or two. It's not like some rural areas where there's builders that do one every couple of months. So we're in California. So they, but most of these new construction agents couldn't make it as a normal real estate agent. They wanted benefits, they wanted full time work, they wanted some consistency. And those agents naturally, you know, hate us because all we're doing is dropping somebody off on their porch and we're getting paid this big fat commission, right? So eventually they don't like you. So I figured that out early. So I would treat them like gods. I would make them feel special. I'd go out of my way to help them. What can I do for you? What could I do for you? There was a time where every single week I would drive by, bring them bagels, bring them my famous snapples, and I would just treat them like, hey, you know, and eventually I learned I'm getting the ones that are falling out of escrow first. I'm getting the best lots. I'm getting the best upgrades without having to ask for it. I'm getting the best closing cost credit. So when I got into REO, I was like, holy crap, these are just new construction agents. They need their booties kissed, licked, you know, and have fun with them because they, they are, they know who we are. So if you're listening, that's, that's a really good way. Just, just know that um, they're people, they have feelings and they're usually a little bit angry when they see you just hit the jackpot because of them. So what, what do you, how do I put this? Let's say you just met Joe at a conference in Dallas and we had maybe five, 10 minutes, use Ford on him, family occupation, record, recreation dreams. What, what would a good follow-up scenario be when you got home? I mean, and, and, and I'm, you're, you and I are very similar and that's why you're on this is because we are very, very strategic, and yes. and we we actually put a lot of thought into what we're going to do for our yep. clients. So, give me a little bit of a a tour of your mind and how follow up works with these people. So, I, so I followed the same system every time. You're right; it was very strategic. I would rarely talk business with us. Use Joe in this case. I'd rarely talk business with Joe when I met him at the conference. It was all connecting and bonding on a personal level. I usually been introduced by somebody right so i already have that credibility as an agent but even if i don't i'm even i just randomly met the person because there's people you'd meet in the lobby bar that you just start to chat with them oh you work for such and such a bank cool and you start making friends because most people at a conference are going to go straight towards talking about business and work and i found that most people like to be connected on a human level first so my first email back and how i'd leave it with them was always like yeah i'll send you my stuff but they would say hey send me your stuff later cool i'll email you back on monday um Typically, unless they told me to send it on Monday, if it had been a conference where we were all together for the whole time, I wouldn't send an email first thing Monday morning because what do you do on Monday morning when you come back? You go through the pile of emails that are waiting for you and all the stuff you have to catch up on. So I'd wait till either, if it really had to be a Monday, midday on Monday, but typically I'd wait till Tuesday to to send my follow-up email and I would send it in a time delay so it wouldn't show up uh, early in the morning. Like if they're in Texas and I'm in California, I want the email to hit their inbox around 10 a.m. local time. And the reason for that is because people check their email from the top down, right? If they have, if you send it overnight or early morning and they come in and they've got 10 other emails ahead of yours, they're going to check whatever the new email that comes in. But if they're cleaning through their inbox and they're starting their day and all of a sudden this email pops up around 10, 1030 and it's from you, they're going to stop what they're doing and probably take a look at it. So, the, and then the content of that email was my first professional. You know, it was great to meet you. Just wanted to send you my coverage area. I had attached my REO resume, which listed all the cities or zip codes that I covered. And I would usually offer um, to do a quick second opinion BPO, which means it's one of the things that like asset managers don't love finding is once they have a property that's assigned, sometimes they need to get a second opinion on what it's worth. If uh, you know, something's not going right with the first agent or who knows what, but they're basically asking for a favor for someone. So I put it right out there. Hey, you need a quick favor? I'll do a quick second opinion BPO anytime. Just let me know how I can help. That was my first email I'd send. I would brand my name with my city. That was the strategic thing I'm trying to do is brand you know, my name, my city. I'm already back now in San Diego. I just not like I'm saying, Jess, goes to San Diego. I'm just dropping in a couple of times references to San Diego. Like you were always dropping in references to Santa Clarita. So that's on mic, baby. That, that, was, that was email number one right? That, that's it. That was the strategic, that was it. From there, 
I would go into either every two weeks or once a month follow up, depending on how close we connected. And the next ones would be more related to something personal or fun that they had talked to me about. So let's say they were a Steelers fan. I'm not a football guy at all. I will admit this. I would have a couple, you know, asset managers. I still remember who were huge Steelers fans. I would literally go Google Pittsburgh Steelers news to find out something interesting happened on the team. And I would say, hey, just saw so-and-so got traded, whatever, whatever, and shoot an email off and be like, hope you had a good weekend. Like, they had, had a good time here in San Diego. Again, branding, my name's San Diego, talking something fun that they'd respond to. And I would alternate most, some personal, but then occasionally a business one. That was my follow-up plan. Yeah. How was yours? Well, you probably remember this vividly. I was always the guy that was very strategic with the camera, right? So anything I would do, I'd be like, take a picture of them with their best friend. Like if they're like all over, I go, oh my God, let me get a picture of you guys. Oh yeah, here, let me text you the picture. Okay, boom, done. So I'd have their cell phone number, right? And I'd be careful and I know who, and you know, I get to know people pretty quick and I would know who I could text and who I couldn't. Um, And then I found out that a lot of them liked to be texted. You know, they were, if, if you had permission to have their cell phone number, they didn't mind. It was text messages, you know, the thing. It still is the thing, right? Um, and then I would, I would, sometimes I would wait until that Tuesday after a conference and I would send them that picture and say, oh, I forgot to send this to you the other night. So good to meet you. Don't forget, I can do backup BPOs for you. How can I help you? I was, it was always coming from a spot of service. And, and, you know, half the time, which was interesting is they did want backup BPOs or they'd be like, Hey, you know, it was really nice to meet you. I've, I've been using an agent in your area for years can you kind of check in on this listing? Is it overpriced? Are they marketing it properly? Can you swing by? They would, like I was doing recon for them, right? Seeing if there's lock boxes up and seeing if the properties were, you know, posted properly with the, you know, no trespassing signs and all that stuff. And pretty soon I was like, yeah, it's, they're good. They're, 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 and I would just give them the correct information. And lo and behold, you know, I would get an assignment or, or a BPO. And sometimes it would just be like, so what's the... Um, Feedly. I used Feedly a lot. So if I knew that Karen loved bunny rabbits, right? So I'd go back to Feedly, I'd type in bunny rabbits and all the articles would be emailed to me every day. So I would get the bunny rabbit article and I would text it to Karen and say, or whatever the name I said, and I would say, hey, check it out. I saw a bunny rabbit article and I thought of you. So I would always do things like that, right? And then I don't think I ever used that one. That's awesome, Feedly. Yeah, <laughs> so we 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 used Feedly a lot when we were doing social media training when it first came out because everybody said I don't know what to post. And back then it was, it, it, th- th- this is what created the information overload age we're living in now was you know articles and media. But back then there wasn't much to post. Social media was really social. It was just family oriented stuff, but then it started becoming an information portal. But anyways, that's a whole nother class. But so I started, I would just do that, right? And then, and then I, would, I would put them in my CRM or my phone. I would just put them under REO. I would say everything about them. I'd be very detailed. And then once a week, I would just kind of like, while I'm eating lunch, I'd type in REO on my phone and just, and just scroll through every one of them, send a text, send an email, follow up with this. You know, I know your daughter graduated, how'd that go? And I would just create these relationships. And then I would send goofy selfies in front of the bunny rabbit, right? So they remember my face. And then, you know, because I was always Magic Mountain Mike, because we live so close to Magic Mountain. So I was always using that. And I would, uh, on my branding, I would put pictures of that in my uh, branding and all that kind of stuff. So they couldn't get rid of me if they wanted to, but I was very careful not to be cheesy. You know, you know when you're cheesy. And if you don't, that's what separates a good REO agent from the rest, right? And then, and then you and I would do really cool things like, <clears throat> you know, birthdays and whatnot. And then we should probably talk a little bit about what was more industry related, like the coloring book and the, the DS Pro's bracelets that we make. We right. would do the hotel. Like, we would buy the entire hotel ds pros keys and we would say to the agents uh, or the asset managers if you have that key and you could turn that in later for five drinks or drink coupons or whatever it was and and we got very strategic and we we would take those sparkly vip bracelets and we'd say listen this is very important that you do not lose this because this is the only way to get into one of our parties and you're allowed to bring a friend or two you know and and we made everything we did very exclusive and very fun. Like all the other network groups would have parties, but they would come to ours, right? We would go, we would do things that other agents couldn't or won't. Ours were more fun. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we would pull in, it was, it'd be like the night of the Grammys, right? There's 10 Grammy parties, but there's one that everybody goes to and it's the right. Vogue magazine one. And we would be the ones that would promote the Vogue magazine party. We would hire the security. We would hire the best DJs, we, you know, do everything we could to make them their experience. Cause they're working. They're at a conference. They have to leave their family. So we're going to do everything we can to make them more comfortable than any other party or event. So, so let's teach a useful networking skill. There might be some already some fantastic networkers on here, but I'm just thinking back to those early days. If I were to go to a conference now, because this applies to other areas of their business outside of REO, right? If you go to local chamber events, things like that. But if, if you're even just talking, if, if and when REO comes back and there's an REO conference in uh, September in Dallas, assuming it happens, it's the five-star REO conference would be the next REO conference. If someone's like, I'm going to come to one of these conferences. If there's REO in my area right now, I know there is. Cool. If you're in Southern California, I'm going to tell you, you're probably still early in the rest of the country. There could possibly REO in your area. You're going to check your local stats. But if you went to a conference and you had no friends, you didn't know anybody, and you're like, if someone's brought me in an area, I want to teach people how they know, how would you go find an asset manager? Because I think it's totally doable. Do you agree, Mike? If you knew nobody, you had no guy, no one to show you around. So I know what I would look for. I want to see how your and I strategy would, would compare. So if you, someone dropped you to conference, you had no guide, no one to introduce you, no one to tell you where to go, where would you go? What would you look for? I would look for a small crowd around a specific person, somebody who walks by and gets their hand shaken a lot. And I would start asking around me, hey, who's that guy over there? Who's that girl over there? And just kind of figure it out. And, I, and I, let's be honest, I did do that. When I was new in REO, yeah. I knew how to network like a champ, but I didn't know these people. And, and, and DS Pros back then had, what, 75, 100 people. And you would be off doing your thing. But I'm like, look, I already met that guy yesterday. I need to meet somebody else. Because I, you know, I would pick three to five very important you know, asset managers. And I would say, okay. I'm going to pull off this strategy and I'm going to go meet these people. And I would have to do that. I just sit by the bar in the corner and I just kind of watch and, you know, and just kind of mingle around a little bit. And I say, Oh, who do you work with here? Oh, I work with Joe. He's the asset manager at bank of America. No kidding. What, what is, where's Joe from? Oh, he said, uh, I get as much information as I could. And then the second I saw somebody I knew talking to Joe, I go over there and go, Hey, Cindy, how you doing? I'm sorry to interrupt. Hey, I'm Mike York. What's your name? Joe. Oh, nice to meet you. So I'm done. You know, I'm so sorry. And so what do you do, Joe? Oh, I work at bank of America. No shit. Oh, you know, I just, and just start talking to them. Right. And then yep. the family occupation, recreation, dreams thing. Yep. And then I would then pick mental notes, phone notes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause you right there before we get into the conversation. But this is, to, to read the room. So you're talking about how to read a room, which I love because you exactly said exactly the same thing strategically I did. Now let's say you don't know someone, you know no one else at this conference. So you can't wait till someone else you, you met goes up and talks to them. This is why it helps the more you network, the better you do though, because as you know more and more people, there's a higher chance that someone you know will go up and talk to this asset manager. Right. But if you truly knew nothing, knew nobody and there is a circle around them, you can't walk up and talk to the most important person in the center of the circle, but you can go talk to someone on the edge of the circle because they're not used to random people coming up and talking to them, so they're not gonna shut you down. They're, you can go and just make friends with them, and then you kind of become part of the circle. Once you start talking to the person on the outside, then you can kind of work your way in, and at that point, you, it comes up in conversation, and you can start talking to the, pers the person of importance. Something else really important that I did that I never, never even really shared this, this might be the first time ever I'm sharing the secret. So I would get the programs of the conference and go online, and I would see all the people that were teaching the classes all the speakers were asset managers and VIPs, right? So I would Google those people and know everything about them before the con conference ever started. I would know exactly what they looked like so I could see and say, okay, that's so-and-so from so-and-so company. That is one of my VIPs that I need to go connect with them during this trip. I would find out where they are. I would see that, you know, so-and-so was having a hosting a party here. I would do anything I had to to get into that party, you know, and, and, you know, you, you've got to remember there was nights we were separated for hours and, you know, I was off <laughs> slutting around doing my own thing, trying to, you know, get my VIPs. Cause we all, once we got good at this, we all had our own little strategies. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I know you only have a few minutes left and I want to respect your time, Jesse. Talk to me about friend working because I think friend working uh, is key in follow-up. And, and you taught this class with me in Seattle and it was an amazing class. And I think, I think that's a good way to follow up um, and this thing with your part at least because that was a game changer for me when I finally got to sit in the audience instead of being a speaker for once. I listened to you and I just went, holy crap, that's it. So explain that to me real quick, 
so the audience can really get an understanding of why you are who you are. Yes, yeah, so, so, so friend working at, at, a, at its core was a, a term we came up with, which is basically to stop networking and start friend working. You're not going out there to network. If you network with someone, they can feel that you're trying to go through them to get to some goal. Friend working is you're going to make friends with them. Like legitimately, we consider most of the asset managers and people that we worked with, I still call them my friends. I still talk to them. We got a ton of business out of it. And there's some deeper things in, in the, you know, when I teach on friend working that I break into, but at a high level, that's what we talk about. Um, one, I think your favorite parts that I actually got from another book that I adapted into friend working, it's from the like switch, L-I-K-E, the like switch. You love the friendship formula, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm begging for right now. Yeah, that's what I figured. The friendship and the friendship formula is the most easily actionable thing you could I've ever learned on networking that when this so I didn't come up with this part of it but I, I worked into something bigger this thing it's it's so straightforward but when you think about it uh the friendship formula is friendship equals four items if you want to write down these four items friendship equals it's basically like a math problem your um intensity duration frequency and proximity intensity, duration, proximity, and frequency. And, I, and I'll break down what each of those are. So in order to develop a relationship, a business relationship, a romantic relationship, whatever, you have to have some mix of those four things. So intensity is the nature of what you guys are talking about. How deep is the conversation? If you're talking about the weather, it's pretty low intensity. If you're talking about something that really impacts their life, that they care about, this is why Mike talks about doing his research first. If you know what they're into, you can speak to something that they love, which then ratchets up that intensity, right? It's why I'm, I just like to ask a lot of questions to people and I'm having deep conversations with people about you know, things in their past and how they grew up and things that are really like deep, like we go deep quickly and that ratchets up the intensity. I do it because I'm naturally curious and I like it, but it, I know that it's consciously bringing that intensity up. You got duration. I don't remember the order I said it in this time, but you got duration. That's the duration, time. frequency, and um, uh, proximity. Okay, so duration. That's how much time you spend with people. Literally the amount of time. The more time you spend with them, the deeper you're going to be connected. That's why all these Zooms we've done over the years, Mike, so all this time we've hung out in person makes us feel like better friends because it's literally just the amount of time we spend together. Okay, you got duration. Proximity. It's how physically close you are. So it's why jumping on a plane, I say there's no substitute for that. Sure. Although being on Zoom like this, like I feel more connected to Mike now than I did 40 minutes ago because I've been looking at his face, right? And if you guys who are watching us on camera, I can't see you, but you can see us. You probably feel more connected to us because you spend time watching us. Our brain, it's called the parasympathetic response. Your brain cannot tell the difference between seeing someone on camera than being in person. Your conscious brain knows, obviously there's a difference, but the pathways of your brain light up in a very similar pattern, watching someone on TV or a screen as standing there face to face with them. It's pretty cool. Uh, and then the last one, so which I cover intensity, duration, oh, frequency. proximity, frequency. It's how often. It's why you know doing follow up regularly helps increase that frequency. So if you're consciously trying to build a relationship with someone, all you do is dial in any of those four factors. You increase any one of them. If you increase all of them, even better. But you can just pick one or two and increase them, and that's going to help you build that relationship with them. That's the formula for strategy for creating relationships. Like, you know, like I've only been at EXP for not even two years, right? And people go, how in the world do you know everybody who's anybody and hang out with these people at the company? Well, I was nervous when I left my own brokerage that I owned to go to more of a corporate feel company. And I go, there's some really powerful, cool people at this company. And I genuinely want to get to know them, create relationships with them and grow it together with these people. Right. Because it's, it's, I've, I've donated my life to this company now. Right. So, but I just use the same, you know, exactly the light switch formula and I won't miss an event. I won't miss an REO event. I mean, people say, dude, how do you travel so much? Because it's important to me. The more pe the more times you see somebody, the first time they're like, yeah, I know who that guy is. The second time is we might have had a drink or dinner. The third time we might have hung out longer. The fourth time we're like text buddies and we're, we could legitimately go to dinner just and never talk about business or something. And, you know, that's, and that's, how you can, that's how you can shorten that curve by doing it more quickly. Right? That's why we used to hop on a plane in between conferences to go visit these clients. So you just do a lot of these things naturally. As a, as a good networker, right? You do a lot of these four items naturally, but you can consciously and strategically 
increase one or two of them and make that relationship happen a little deeper and a little more quickly. God. Do you really need to go at 1045? Because it is. Yeah, it's time for five minutes. Okay, good. Because that's, you just brought up a really good point. So, so duration, frequency, all this stuff is very important because we didn't even say that. After the conferences, we would have very small intimate groups and we would go visit them, buy their office yeah. lunch, get an office tour, then we'd go out to dinner with them afterwards. And now we have them all to ourselves. And that's where that intimacy gets really powerful. That's where trust is built. That's where, you know, that's where you get to know them, like I said, intimately. And that's what creates an unbreakable bond with people. And you will never lose that account in REO unless you're a real ding dong, right? Like you have to get caught doing something unethical or lying, all the things you don't want to do anyways, but you will have that account forever. As long as you give, you know, 95 plus percent effort to your job, but we would literally, and we'd be strategic on that too. Like me, you, Dave, and would bring a couple of the, the girls that would fit in with those personalities. And we would go out there and plan cool stuff. And, and it was top secret too. We didn't tell anybody. We didn't advertise it. We barely posted on Facebook. We were posting on planes, but they didn't know where we were going. And we were getting into the heart of building those relationships that to this day, we still have unbreakable bonds with these people 10 years That's- later. Well, yeah, and, and that was the goal of the follow-up via email was to go set and cement another face-to-face meeting where you could come to their office. I mean, that, that was, it was kind of like when you're on the phone with a new lead, the goal is to book a face-to-face appointment. When you book a face-to-face appointment, your goal is then to go either have them sign a listing or sign a buyer agreement. Same thing as an asset manager. We meet them at a conference and we start doing follow-up with the goal to book another face-to-face appointment. Yeah. Oh man, you're bringing back so many fun memories. You guys, you have no idea what Jesse and I have been through. Planes, oh, there's planes, some automobiles, time. like you, <laughs> all these memories are coming up right now. I was going, Jesus, how do we make it through this? But you know what? That's the difference. You know, there's a fighter and there's a slacker. You know, when most people were getting out of the business, you know, I was designing different ways to create better relationships. So I started knowing that REO was just like property management. So I started teaching agents how to do property management, but I told the asset managers that property management, if I taught their agents property management, they would manage their REOs better, right? So now here I am on stage next to these people speaking. And of course I'm invited to those VIP dinners with them afterwards. And, and that spread really wide. And then I was teaching the asset managers property management properly. So their managers would hire me to teach them. And what did that lead into? Then I was consulting for Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. I was working for B of A, Wells Fargo. The DOJ hired me as a consultant towards the end of this REO thing. And I created a platform for myself to where when I walked into a room, people want to know who the hell I was, you know? So, I mean, those, those strategy steps work, but that was the time where most people were losing everything, getting out of the business. And because I took the step, I did property management and REO, we excelled through that market like rock stars and, you know, and it worked. Let me, let me, let me say this before I have to jump off. I, I do believe that REO will come back and increase. But there are things that the government can do and is doing right now, like there's a foreclosure moratorium that's been extended through uh, the end of August, and a foreclosure and a victim eviction moratorium. There is a chance that ARIA will not come back in the same way. I, I believe it will, but there's a chance it won't. So those of you who are watching this going, I don't want to do any of this ARIA stuff. Don't worry, there's a chance it may not come. We want to make sure that you are positioned and prepared that if it does come back, you know what you need to do to kick butt and stay in the game. That's, that's the whole reason for this conversation. Right. And this works for anything else. And I'll tell you one thing too, and, and you can hang up whenever you have to go, but the reality is, is REO will not come back the same. If, if history repeats itself, I'd be very surprised, even though it somewhat does. But I think the next go around will be pre-approved short sales, which is heaven. I, uh, you know, we, that's when B of A hired me in Wells Fargo. That's what I was doing was consulting them on pre-approved short sales to where they were giving us pre-approved short sales where you go to the door, they're like, oh, thank God our real estate agent's here. That's different than REO, right? Way and different. Think, so it'll be the same way. We'll still be entertaining and networking with those people that make those decisions. But the second thing that's going to come back very strong is Zoom, auction.com, and anybody else similar to that because the REO 
uh, banks did start really favoring those things towards the end. Remember, we would get a listing from B of A, and they would also put it on auction.com, and we were getting mad and frustrated, but we worked it out towards the end. And I well, think it's going to be another thing. Ex explain that. I, I, I do have to jump off because I have for the next appointment, but thank you for having me on, everyone watching. Love you, Love love you guys. But it, but yeah, you can wrap it up with that. I'll, I'll talk to you guys later on. You're my belly. All right. So, Thanks for having me on. <laughs> so to explain that to you guys in a little different sense, so – so Zoom and auction.com, Zoom's known by NationStar, the biggest lender in the country, all that stuff, and auction.com, and they all got millions of dollars from Google and investors and whatnot. So I believe that when the banks do have these vacant properties, or they don't even have to be vacant, uh, the auction platform is a very good platform to put them on. Um, and I think we're going to start seeing that come back a lot. Um, so that's just one of the things that I wanted to let you guys know that was happening. I really hope you guys enjoyed listening to Jesse because, you know, the more I thought about it during this conversation about REO, it's no different, you guys. So if you were to do community outreach in your town for that sort of farming, I use the same strategies for my social media. I use the same strategies in my property management business. I use the same strategies in my networking for attracting agents to EXP. All that stuff works. And if you follow that really simple and get that book like switch, I think you guys are going to be uh, very excited about what happens to your relationships. And if you start practicing all these things now, if and when the REO market comes back, you guys are going to be set. I would do everything you could to contact us about joining DS Pros because that's very real. Um, and that's honestly how I got into REO right now. Uh, otherwise, it takes years to get in, you guys. It's not worth it. So take advantage of getting a coach and a mentor for REO if you're going to be serious about it. Um, so also, we have, since we do have so many relationships in the default industry, I'm going to be bringing back a couple people in the next couple months, and we're going to talk about um, trends and things that are going on in the market right now that are indicators of the REO market coming back. Um, Every week, Jesse interviews an asset manager on the DS Pros call, or almost every week. And we're getting to know their inventory, what's going on with them, the policies and procedures changes they're going through, the training they're going through, the software and platform training they're going through. So we're always in the know. You know, when everybody thinks, oh, Mike, you're just selling retail. No, I'm on the call every Friday at eight o'clock in the morning with these guys. And we record them and we rewatch them. And then Jesse and I, and sometimes Dave and a couple other people, we go back and we talk about these accounts. So we'll say, okay, Seems to me that this person just bought this person, these two people merged, this person got hired to this, that, and the other, and we will strategize, and we keep a very serious CRM, and we keep all that in line because it's our job to know if and when, let's say we do go to the five-star conference in September, we will have strategy meetings um, you know, a week or two in advance. We'll talk about who we want at these things. We'll talk about what we're going to do for the events. Like, are we going to go get a suite at the Dallas, you know, football game? Are we going to go to this concert? Who else is in town? Are we going to go to this hot spot? You know, all those different things. And we make sure we slowly, but start, uh, surely, but slowly start building these events up to where these asset managers know about them, where they are before we even get there. So that's all planned. We ask them to invite their friends. Sometimes we're very specific on who we would like them to invite because we know who knows who. So it's, it's a big strategy. So the people in the group of DS Pros, they get to show up and just reap the benefits of all of our hard work for all the previous months, um, strategizing and putting all this stuff together. So that's about it for today, guys. I'm jumping in the RV. I'm gonna go to the beach for the week and uh, get on some more Zooms and just kind of relax on the sand. I wish you guys all the best. If you have questions, let me know. I could talk to you guys more offline about REO, uh, the default market, short sales, loan modifications, all that kind of stuff that we excelled in during the default market. And that's about it. But I love you guys. Thank you so much for being committed to this coaching series. And I, I love listening to you guys and hearing all the success you're having from going back and watching the previous weeks. And I love watching your careers unfold. And remember, the goal of me doing this every week is to take you guys and bypass all the nightmare 30 years of hell I had to go through and just get you caught up to speed on everything so you guys could be really successful and have a blessed life. Love you guys. Talk to you soon. I think that's it for today. Talk to you a little later.